I sat uncontrollably shaking. My hands trembled so much I could barely keep a hold of the paperback book I had been trying to read. My feet freezing cold in the rough, thin hospital slipper socks that have the weird rubber grips on the bottom so that you don't slip. This feeling wasn't anything new for me. Another panic attack in a long line of panic attacks I had suffered, each one getting more intense than the worst than the last. <sighs> I'm fine. Just push through it. Other people have it worse. I repeat to myself. I joined the estimated 1.4 million people a year in the United States who have attempted to commit suicide. I was in the common room of a military hospital that felt like a fishbowl. There was no place to run. I couldn't go out to my car and excuse myself so I could hold on as I fell apart. I could, um, the room's atmosphere was a low buzz of a, uneasiness and distress. There was nowhere to hide. The floor cut, or the, the walls covered with floor to ceiling windows lining every bedroom surrounding the center room area so that staff can monitor pa patients. There was nowhere to run and to hide what I had been running from for almost seven years since I had come home from Iraq. I had severe PTSD and I wanted to die. I wanted to die. I had been trapped in this inky tar pit of despair pain and mental torture that only drug me deeper and became more hopeless and torturous as time went on. Life became more than painful. It was an inescapable nightmare. I often describe it as the mental and emotional equivalent of having toothpicks shoved under your fingernails over and over and over again, day in and day out. I wanted to die. For many months and maybe even a couple of years, I cried whenever I woke up in the morning because it meant I didn't die in my sleep and I had to face another day in my own personal hell. But I didn't just get to PTSD from my time in Iraq. I remember at the age of three, knowing that frozen beans and cheese burritos my mom had gotten me, took a minute and 20 seconds to cook in the microwave. <sighs> Fucking loved those things. I still love them to this day. But three-year-old me did not like them for the same reason as that they are fucking delicious. The first reason was because it filled my tiny tummy and eased the hunger pains as my stepfather slept. The second reason was that my stepfather stayed asleep. Waking him was always, always ended in pain, but rarely a full belly. I still remember the fire and lightning that would that would jolt through my fragile body as I bounced off furniture or walls down to the floor with a dull thud. As he threw me around, fear and panic engulfed my pint-sized mind with each blow. When will the last one come? When is it gonna stop? I often would have to continue to deal with the hunger pains that drove me to wake the sleeping devil in the first place. I also remember the bruises on my toes and the blisters I had underneath my toenails from the donated shoes that were a size too small for me in sixth grade. But I wore them because they were the only thing I had. My mother walked to her factory job more than four miles away every day just to walk back the four miles after a 12 hour shift, even in the northern frigid Ohio winters. She did this for wages that barely covered a place for her and I to live, and anything for more than food and shelter, which wasn't always stable, it was a luxury. Christmas, birthday, tax season, that's when I got clothes. And when I grew out of them, I wore them anyway. 
I'm fine. Just push through. Other people have it worse. How many times have we said these phrases or phrases like these? I don't know when I adopted them, but for me, these phrases were probably the only thing that I used more than the word fuck. My close friends will tell you I use the F word like it's seasoning on a bland meal. Everywhere. <sighs> I'm fine. Just push through. Other people have it worse. I keep repeating to myself. The air is frigid and easily pierces a thin layer of my scrubs. I keep praying that these words will somehow stop the waves of tremors that crashing through my body like storm waves hitting the coast. Even though these words haven't helped me for quite some time, I still tried desperately. There was no place to run and I had no choice but to fall apart in slow motion in front of staff and other patients. I crumble apart in what feels like slow motion. I can't control my breathing. I can't control my body shaking. My heart is pounding my already painfully tight chest. I can't control the tears of panic that start streaming down my face as much as I fight to. <sighs> I'm fine. Just push through. Other people have it worse. I, show, I learned not to show weakness to protect myself. In my world, if I showed weakness, also known as reasonably needing anything, I would become the target. These phrases were my mental life raft I clung to while in a sea of fear when it seemed that there were no land or relief in sight. These words coupled with perfectionism, overachieving, were my survival mechanisms. By middle school, I started focusing on my grades. <laughs> I was a fucking Hermione. <laughs> I was a little know-it-all who always had the answers. I went to 13 different schools growing up, so, I didn't, so it didn't matter what my schoolmates thought of me. I'd be moving again in a year. <sighs> I threw myself into every free sport and extracurricular activity I could juggle to stay away from my home show choir, women's choir, theater, foreign language clubs, swim team. I told you, I was a fucking Hermione. But I found my great escape at age 11, cross country and track. I was a natural long distance runner and I was fast, not to mention competitive. I won and I won often. There was something about the rhythm of my feet pummeling the ground, sinking with my breathing, as I hit my pace that just made me feel like I had to, that I could fly, that I had wings. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. It was just me and the course. Nothing else mattered except for catching the person in front of me and leaving them far behind. Everything else melted away when I ran. All the chaos, the fear, the stress, Everything just simply disappeared. All of this gave me the feelings of security, validation, and order from the teachers and staff. Everything I'd been craving my entire childhood. This lifestyle, continu this lifestyle continued into the Marines where my perfectionism and overachieving was not only rewarded, it was the lifeblood of the Marine Corps. Every move is calculated, and anything less than perfection is looked down upon. From grooming to physical fitness to job performance, every detail is looked at and measured. I was promoted rapidly in rank, and I was qu quickly identified as what the Marines call a fire and forget weapon. I was consistently given more responsibility in, in my leadership. Oh, sorry. Okay, I was consistently given more responsibilities and jobs above my pay grade. I was awarded for my exceptional performance in physical fitness, marksmanship, leadership, and my job field. My coping mechanisms 
not only worked, they allowed me to excel and receive accolades. They worked until they didn't. <sighs> I'm fine, just push through. Other people have it worse. The words still aren't working, I'm falling apart now, and I have an audience, which only heightens everything. The energy in the room shifts from a low from the previous low buzz to a tenseness that's almost palpable. No one knows what anyone can or will react to at any given time. None of us know each other or what brought them here. Everyone's eyes are on me, watching, waiting, wondering, what will I do? I have nowhere to run. I'm shaking like I'm having my own personal earthquake and tears are silently streaming down my face as I'm trying to catch my breath, as I'm trying everything I can to make seem what seems to be a tidal wave of fear, panic, and terror subside. A woman from the staff approaches me. Are you all right? Is there anything that I can do for you? She says to me cautiously as she sits next to me at the table. I'm looking straight down to my lap, partially to hide my face and partially to hide others' faces from my view. I catch glimpses of my many tear stains on the thin fabric of my pants between the blur of tears in my eyes. Through the blur, I can see the pattern of her blue navy camouflage uniform. I'm able to choke out the words. I'm fine, between the gasps and the tears. It was my automatic response to any question that had to do with me and how I was doing. It had been for decades. She pauses and she says very gently, I know you're not fine and that's okay. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay. It was the first time I had heard those words in my 32 years of life. It was the first time I had been given permission to be anything but perfect without consequences. I was allowed to be human and not a smiling robot with all the right answers and all the responsibilities on her shoulders. I started crying even harder, but the tears now weren't filled with panic and fear. They were tears of relief. My shoulders heaved freely as I cried. I didn't even try to control it or hide it, nor did I want to. I just let go. Even though those simple words hadn't cured my problems, those words had power. They had lifted a weight and dispelled a belief that was literally stealing my will to live and almost killed me. It's okay to not be okay was like the key that opened the door for me to regain my life. Not one where everything was viewed as right or wrong, strong or weak, good or bad, but an even better life where I didn't try to live up to unrealistic expectations, whether they were self-imposed or cu culturally imposed. Those words gave me hope, which used to be a dirty four-lettered word to me. It opened the door to my healing and recovery and helped me change the way I thought and the way that I spoke. Today, I still use three phrases to help me in difficult times, but I've changed how I say them. I'm fine turned into, I'm not fine, but I will be. Just push through turned into, this sucks but it won't last. And other people have it worse turned into, it's okay to not be okay. The phrase that saved my life. Thank you.